Hey, and welcome to the Wake Up Show. My name is King Shlojim. I hope you are doing great. I hope you are doing fantastic. So today we are starting a new book. We are reviewing a new book called 2084 by Professor John Lennox. Let's get right into it. Okay, so if you've been following my uh, my show, my youtube channel or listening to the podcast you would realize that uh, for the past two weeks we have been reviewing books um actually we've only reviewed just one book but you get what i mean um we we're doing a segment called fill in the shelves and we basically take a book and then review it and then talk about the key ideas of the author and then you know, try to pick out certain bits where maybe we agree or disagree or we think will be of um a valuable lesson for all, all of us so thanks once once again for joining me today and today we're doing 2084 artificial intelligence and the future of humanity by the same person professor john lennox i love this man uh, i think he's a great he's a great um philosopher like i said before i'm not going to say much about him in this episode so if you haven't listened to my other episodes please do because um, especially my last two um episodes i speak a little more about professor john lennox if you want to know more about him but i want us to get right into what we're doing today uh 2084 now when i first saw the title of this book if you told me that professor john lennox wrote this book i would have i would have said no there's no way because it sounds very dystopian it feels like oh 2084 um what lies ahead of us what is in the future if, if it sounds like some kind of prophetic book trust me well it is it is it is prophetic in a sense i guess um but then it is done in an in a more intellectual way and you wouldn't even you wouldn't even think that there was any prophetic element to it um I'll just use a term just because you know it is talking about the future, and when people when people think about the future, what they think is uh, prophecy, and I think we did a, an episode on prophecy, so check that out as well. Um, as a matter of fact, just go back and then watch all the episodes if you can, and then like, comment, share, subscribe, and do all this great stuff. I will appreciate it a lot. So. Um, I just want to give a brief background of this book. I'll try to keep this um, book review, for, the book review for 2084 um, as one episode. And I'm not going to do parts. And so I'll try to keep it um, as one, not like 15 minutes divided into two, like what I did before. So brief background about this book. So this book basically talks about artificial intelligence and the ethical implications of the development or the advancement of AI and why we should think about these, you know, issues. Um, they're not they're not just like something you will see in a sci fi movie or sci fi novel and go like, oh yeah, it's just in the sci fi novel it might not happen some of the ideas discussed in the book even professor lennox things the possibility is not great but we need to consider um how we approach stuff like that as christians especially and even as unbelievers especially if you're the type of person who believes in freedom who believes in um the individual's right to make decisions for themselves and not just the few at the top making all the decisions for you okay so that is just a brief um brief introduction to the book and that is a the theme of the book basically so professor lennox starts by talking about two dystopian novels one is very well known uh, 1984 by george orwell if I think some of you know it, if you don't, George Orwell is basically this guy who um, wrote a novel and talking about how the future was going to be. Um, I don't want to labor on it um, that much because we're not doing that today. Um, and we have Huxley and they are both talking about a dystopian future, right? A very um, 
not nice future. Everything seems messed up. Um, ever everyone is just you know being suffocated and all this kind of stuff. But then they're approaching it from very different angles. And so, Orwell, he he really feared that what we hated or what we hate would ruin us. Whereas Huxley, he thought that what we love will ruin us, which is a very Two very interesting perspectives, and both of them have merits, um, especially in our day to day. Um, if you want to make a you know, inference as to what they said and what is happening in our culture today, you can definitely definitely um, see that both of them happening at the same time. So, for example, Professor Lennox goes on and he talks about how Orwell wants that we will be overcome by imposed oppression. But then Huxley talks about the fact that people will come to love oppression, you know, to adore the technologies that undo their capa- capabilities to, to, to think. So people just want someone to do it for them. People just want the government to do it for them. People just want the technology to do all the calculations for them. Okay. And, and Orwell also thought that you know, there will be a lot of banning of books in the future. Um, but then Huxley thought actually there wouldn't be a need for that because there will be a lot of books and then people wouldn't be reading. So if people are not going to read, then why do you ban them anyways? Um, Huck, um, Orwell thought that we will be deprived of information. Huxley thought that actually there will be so much information, there will be no need to ban them. The truth will be concealed. Oh, that was Orwell's idea. Huxley was just saying that actually the truth will become irrelevant. Um, and everyone, what everyone thinks is what they think is right. And there will be nothing like, you know, objective reality. It's just going to be subjective. And we see that in our culture today. So all these really, really interesting ideas. Um, you can you can check. You can check those books, as, books out as well uh, if you want to. But, Professor Leonard goes on and then he sort of lays out the type of questions his book addresses. Or his book, yeah, his book addresses. Um, so questions like, what does it mean to be human? Um, in what in what sense will technology change what it means to be human? What are the ethical norms that should apply to AI development? Is right a meaningful category applied to AGI? Well, that's a fancy way of saying should robots have rights, basically. Um, he also talks about, or he asks a question, how will technology um, advancement affect the way in which people, believers or unbelievers, think of God? And finally, he addresses the issue, is the future really much brighter than we think or, or we imagine? These are very interesting questions that we should be paying attention to. So you can see where Professor Lennox is going with, you know, his ideas and his arguments and stuff like that. Obviously, I'm not going to mention every word in the book. I'll try to keep as brief as possible. That's why it is a book review. It is not um, audible. So you're not going to get the whole thing. I'm just going to mention the key, some key ideas and then you can go on and have a read for yourself. And so... He moves on and he talks about the bright side of AI, artificial intelligence. Actually, I, I forgot to mention AGI stands for artificial general intelligence. And AG, he, he, Professor Linus claims that this is a bit different from AI. So AI is artificial intelligence, but an AGI is more the technology that more or less tries to imitate what humans do. Uh, and that is the simplest way I can put it. So yeah, AGI imitates humans, and then AI basically looks at algorithms and then try to figure out what is happening and uses um, systems to solve problems. Um, so he goes on and then he talks about the benefits of uh, the bright future of AI or. Um, technologies in general. He was talking. He was talking about the medical advancement and the fact that we have more accurate diagnoses these days um, because of the development of AI. 
uh, digital assistants, language translators you can go into. I don't know. Right now I'm in the UK, you can go to France or Germany or Spain, wherever, and you can just use Google Translate and then you can speak the language, basically. Or you don't even need to speak the language. Google will speak the language for you. Um, when we look at the manufacturing industries, um, the fact that they're able to produce on mass scale and that that is basically due to the fact that um, technology has evolved and they're able to do a lot of things. They're able to effectively and uh, efficiently um, maximize production. That's some little economics right there. <laughs> but then there are some downsides when you look at stuff like automated vehicles. Now, they sound cool and all this other stuff, right? But then we haven't really thought deeply about the ethical implications of automated um, cars, for example. So you, Tesla is doing a lot of, um, they're, they're bringing, they're creating a lot of, you know, automated, self-automated cars. And you can just sit down in the car, it's just going to take you wherever you're going. I guess that's the idea behind it. Um but then one of the problems that we can think about is the idea that it might be very difficult to distinguish between a human being and an ordinary object lying lying beside the road. So how does the, how does the AI system dis distinguish that? Okay, so that is something they can consider. How is it going to affect traffic? How is it going to affect the the jobs of um, taxi drivers and all these other stuff? So we need to bear those stuff in mind. But then, Professor Linux um, is also very cautious of the fact that AI can bring about a lot of um, not great stuff, stuff that are not great. The bad side side of AI, the gloomy future of AI. We talk about the threats of um, jobs, the the fact that a robot can put you out of work, the fact that and. AI system can decide that you're not fit for the job just because there are certain parameters that employers have set and maybe your CV is good and if a, if a human being checked your CV or if you had an interview with a human being, you probably would have been considered but then the AI cannot function outside the system and so we have a lot of trouble when it comes to stuff like employment and surveillance, that is a big issue. Now, I think a lot of people's attitude towards surveillance is, oh, well, I'm not doing anything bad, you know, I'm not I'm, I'm not a terrorist or I'm not doing anything dodgy on the internet or I'm living a pretty decent life. Like, you know, you can spy on me for all I care, right? That is the attitude that people take. But if you want to take that attitude, that's fine. But we need to understand that it is not about... The fact that someone is spying on you, that is bad enough, right? But then it is a precedent we are setting as a society. And he talks about the fact that we have a capitalist surveillance system and a communist surveillance system. And basically the capitalist system is where you have people like um, companies like, like big tech, right? So the Facebook, Amazon, Google and all these huge tech giants, right? They're taking up your data, harvesting your data and monetizing it. And they're making money off your data. They're making money off what you're doing online. They're making money on your personal details because they sell it to companies that are doing, you know, are, want to put out adverts and stuff like that. They want to target specific people. They're doing all these kind of things, right? And so they harvest your data. They have your data. And what, what that means is that we are setting a precedent for a communist um, um, or a surveillance system like what we have in China, right, where the government uses AI systems and these giant comp corporations to to sort of, um, to basically keep a twenty four eye a twenty four seven eye on on the citizens of of that country and for social manipulation and social control, right? And this was John Lennox on China using AI as a social control tool. And I quote directly from uh, from the book. This is quite a lengthy quote, so bear with me. 
Now, this is what he says, quote, They, China, are gradually rolling out social credit system in order to check on the reliability and trustworthiness of citizens. The system consists in uh, it consists of certain citizens um, or each citizen with the award of 300 social credit points that can be added to that can be added to by good government approved behavior like using public transport keeping fit reporting someone you have seen with large amounts of foreign currency all these things you know <laughs> they sound really crazy um, those are my words not his uh, I'll move on as your points accumulate, you you are you are granted more and more perks, access to a wider range of jobs, mortgage opportunities, school placements for children, goods and travel opportunities, etc. If you behave in ways thought antisocial, like associating with people regarded as unsafe by the government, coming into conflict with the police, or overindulging in alcohol you will lose points and that will eventually result in penalties. We're looking at limited access to the job and housing market, restrictions on travel or even on the range of restaurants you can visit and many other stuff happening over there. Um, you might even end up being denounced as a discredited person on a public television screen as you walk past it. I don't know how you feel about that. But I don't want to live in such a community or such a society or such a country. And that is what we're doing here in the West. We think, oh, it's okay, you know, just allow the big tech guys to do whatever they do. I know we have GDPR, I think that's what it's called in the UK. But how 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 much are we investing in actually protecting the privacy of, of, of the citizens? And it is not just because you're doing something dodgy on the internet, right? If you're doing something dodgy on the internet or you, you're you planning something dodgy, then stop it, okay? But then it is just because we are setting the precedent for something we wouldn't want to happen. And that is what uh, Professor Lennox is warning us about here. Now, AI can also be used for, or we have the military use of AI, right? So we have stuff like autonomous weapons being deployed in, in warfare and they can be used to identify, search out and then eliminate human target. What could go wrong with this? It could end up in the wrong hands. It could, you know, what if it is hacked? What what do we do? And what if what if we hear of, you know, drone strikes and all these, uh, these technologies are there and they will, they will be built upon in the future. So we need to be having those conversations now. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, but especially if you're a Christian, we need to be having, you know, these conversations. They are very, very important. You know, we can't ignore them. Now, this is my favorite part of the book. This is the last section of the book that I'll be talking about. The idea of upgrading humans, or some people call it transhumanism. Now, this is the idea that the, the human race will eventually get to a point where they are indestructible or immortal, if you like. Yes, we know that as a result of um, technological advancement, we are able to live longer and enjoy good quality life. But then, when we get to that point, now, some people refer to the point, that point as the Omega point. Not only will we be using technology, but then we will have technology embedded in us. We will be embedded uh, with technology. So not only will, we, will you be using your phone um, and then texting people and doing all this kind of stuff, right? But then, so for example, let me give an example. Um, Elon Musk, um, he came out the other day, he said he's been able to implant some sort of um, chip in the brain of a monkey. I think it's called Neuralink or Neuralink, something like that. I haven't really read into it that much. I just heard about it. So we were talking about stuff like that, stuff that we will do as humans to, I don't know, give us some sort of power or some 
maybe power is not the right word. Power sounds very, um, yeah, it's not a nice word to use in this case. Um, but then it will give us, you know, superhuman abilities, I should say, superhuman abilities. So those kind of stuff. Now, the whole premise of transhumanism is to take the power away from God, so to speak, and, you know, give that power to human beings. Now, the only problem with that is that when, whenever man tries to take the power from God or to be free from what some may call the superstitious belief in God, it is only a minority of you, which some may call the elitists, who become the gods over the majority of us. And we know what that happens, what, what, what happens when power is concentrated at the top, just a few people having power. We know that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But yeah, we know that these powerful people, when 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 they invent stuff, they are in charge of how the thing is going to run, they are in charge of how the thing is programmed. The rest of us, we don't really have much of a say, so this might be facetious, but Imagine we end up colonizing Mars here yeah? and Elon Musk is still alive. I say we, actually, I wouldn't want to go to Mars. I'm happy here. I'm fine here. Um, but, you know, those who end up going to Mars, you have Elon Musk. He's probably going, going to go, I, I presume. But then when you get there, I'm sure he would want to be the president of uh, whatever it is of Mars. Right, you have this giant dictator because she's gonna go like, well, if it wasn't for me, you guys wouldn't be here, and then he gets to set all the rules and all the laws, you know. And this is just a hypothetical. And by the way, all the ideas, most of the ideas expressed in the book are, you know, in the distant future. So we're talking hundreds of years, and even the possibility is an issue. And Professor Lennox goes into um, a bit of detail in 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 the book. So. But go 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 check it out i really recommend it um you won't regret you, you won't regret reading the book now this is the final point um or the last but one the ai applied to morality so if there ever comes a time where humans develop super advanced ai beings or super humans um who gets to decide the morality of those superhumans? Let's call them that, superhumans. Especially in the age of relativ relativism, where everyone gets to decide what they want to do. There's nothing like objective truth and morality. So if I create, for example, if I create a superhuman, right, I will impose on that superhuman my value system because they have no consciousness. Now, the fact that something is intelligent doesn't mean it is conscious right almost all animals as i say are intelligent to some degree depending on how you define intelligence right but then they're intelligent to some degree if they're not they wouldn't be able to survive right but then human beings are conscious right we are conscious and we can't create consciousness when it comes to artificial um artificially designed machines okay we can't we can't give them that sort of consciousness consciousness it's only god that gives that kind of consciousness and so for me i will be imposing my value system on that robot right for someone else for an atheist they will be imposing their world value on that 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 um robot or whatever it is so what happens if that that superhuman right becomes so powerful that they feel like they have to eliminate those who are not on on their side i don't know that's just something to think about and something we should consider when we're thinking about creating superhumans okay it's, it all sounds very fictional and very sci-fi you get the sci-fi vibes but then the discussions that we should be having but because we are forsaking the Bible as a, the primary source of ethics, 
or discussing ethics, we don't even go there, right? And the final point, the true homo deus. So homo deus is basically the idea of a superhuman, like what I've been saying. And what does what does the Bible say about homo deus? We know that we Christians, we have witnessed the homo deus. The only homo deus, the only superhuman, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was 100% man and he was 100% God, right? So if we are striving to get to a point where we wouldn't experience death, we wouldn't experience pain, we we will have that super intelligence or whatever the case is, we have an example in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has promised that he's coming back again to gather his saints and we shall rule, rule with him um, when he comes back and we are going to be we will have glorified bodies. In other words, we Christians know that we don't need technology to make us superhuman as a matter of fact. We know that there's a time coming where this our mortal body, right? The the Bible says are uh, incorruptible. Uh, uh, what, what does the Bible say um, about incorruptible putting on corruptible, or corruptible putting on incorruptible? Don't check me. But basically, the idea that you know there will come a time where we will have glorified bodies, right? Bodies that do not die, we will not die, right? So we have that assurance, and. I pray and hope that if you if you're still searching and if you you know desire to be a superhuman, Jesus Christ is our example and he's more than happy, he's more than willing to welcome you, right? And then come as you are, he's going to accept you and he's going to be the Lord of your life and he will turn your life around. You don't have to wait to be a superhuman for your life to be turned around. Okay, All right. So this is where I will stop for today. That is the end of the segment, the book review. From next week, we are going to be doing news headlines. And I'm really excited about it because now we can talk about the scripture in, in practice in our contemporary society. And I hope you know, you're, you're all looking forward to it. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you learned a thing or two. And do well to subscribe, like, share, comment. If you're listening via podcast, do rate us, you know, five stars or whatever stars they give. Um, and hopefully you come back next week for more. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a lovely day. The Lord be with you. Godspeed. <laughs>